Hi, Vanessa here, and welcome back to my channel. We have a special guest joining us today whose new book, Life and Other Shortcomings, is launching this August 4th and is already on Parade Magazine's list of best beach reads of 2020, and also part of the exciting lineup of BookSparks 2020 Summer Reading Camp. Her award-winning fiction and personal essays have appeared in over two dozen publications. Please help me give a warm welcome to Corey Ajme. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be with you today. And thank you for making the time to chat with us. Um, congratulations on life and other shortcomings. Thank you. It is super exciting. For the listeners um, who are not familiar with you, can you share a little bit of who is Corey? Well... Um, I am a writer and a mom, a storyteller, um, somebody who is a teacher interested in psychology and overall mental well-being. And it's interesting you say that because you place, you wear so many hats, and I can see a lot of that in your work. When I, when I hear you say all the roles that you do and, and what you're passionate about, I see all of that coming onto the pages of your book as well. So is that something you pull a lot from? I, for sure, yeah. I, I'm very interested in a lot of things. And as I get interested in certain subjects or topics, they um, find their way to the page for sure. And speaking of the pages... Like we had mentioned, Life and Other Shortcomings is soon to be published. Can you share um, a little bit of synopsis with us? Sure. Um, the stories are largely about women and their everyday lives um, and struggles and situations that women might find themselves in, um, their hopes, their dreams, their wishes, often in patriarchal society. Um, and Two of the stories are told from the male perspective, but overall, I think um, it's a story about women. And what I found most unique about the story that you had collected is that they are a collection of short stories. Yes. And that each of them had such a profound symbolic message. Like, was the editing process so challenging because you had to edit it down to that specific tableau of just that scene? Um, you know, originally these stories were written as standalone pieces. Mm -hmm. So each one was its own story and had its own point of view. Um, and what happened was over time, it felt like my characters would know one another and that th they could talk to each other and they might just be separated by just a few degrees of separation. And so you know, it, it just felt natural that they would be together in one book. I liked when I read it that I had met somebody in maybe the first or second story, and then I met, I've seen them come back later on. Yeah. And it, it was kind of nice to, like, see them again in a different point of view. But I had also been to so many other places in the other stories um, that it was like seeing an old friend again. Yeah. So I really, yeah. I really enjoyed that part. That's cool. Thank you. So Thank even though they were like, even though each story was like a little slice of life story, mm -hmm. um, I thought I liked the continuation of that as well to bring them back so they weren't gone forever. But writing one story is a huge accomplishment. Writing multiple stories is amazing. Like where do you find the discipline and and we talked about inspiration for the creativity that you draw from life, but what kind of discipline do you need to accomplish something like that? Well, writing is something I came to late. I was in my mid-30s, and um, I really just approached it one story at a time. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to be a writer. I just stumbled onto storytelling in graduate school, and when I graduated, I still wanted to tell stories. So I told one and worked on my craft and read and then told another, maybe from a different point of view. And I kept challenging myself to do maybe one story from a female perspective and then one from a male perspective and then one in first person and one in third person. And there was no long-term plan. It was just building one after another. I love that. And that's very inspirational for a lot of people who think that as a writer, you need to have been writing for so many years. Like 
for me, I love reading. And I think all of the readers' secret dreams is someday to become a writer too. But, you know, you always have that thought, like, oh, it's too late. Like, these writers must have been writing forever, you know, but you're sharing this inspiration that you've come to discover your passion later in life yes. and you were able to build upon it. So I really like that message. Yeah, I think, um, I think it is kind of, it was an organic process that just felt an easy, I think if I had said to myself, like, I want to be like the next great American author, <laughs> but it's not written a word. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's easy just to give myself one small challenge at a time. And uh, the short story was just a form that came somewhat natural to me. So it felt good. It felt like a good way to work on my craft and begin. Well, the thing about writing, when I think about it, it's so easy to maybe fill so many pages, like kind of like word vomit and just put everything out there, you know, but to what you did to pare it down to maybe just a couple of pages but not lose the importance and the tone of what you're conveying, that's the challenging part, to make every single word count. And I think you pulled it off amazingly. Yeah. I, it seemed like there was nothing that I didn't need to read, um, but I still just walked away with such a heavy, like everything was very heavy, reflective, and humorous at the same time at some points of it. So I thought that was quite magical as a reader. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. You had mentioned the narrative um, is primarily focused on the aspects of womanhood, um, which is sometimes glamorized in the media, but you created a very honest conversation that seems to be the theme of these stories from adolescence to adulthood. Can you share more about your writing process to achieve that? I think originally I might have been struck by a certain character trait. and. I would just start to explore that. Um, and then maybe an incident would happen, mm -hmm. and I would want to explore that. And the whole process, I'd say, the way I work is very organic. I think many writers sit down and they've got an outline and a plan, and they know what's going to happen first, second, and third, and you know, all the way through the beginning, the middle, the end. Um, I don't really work like that. I, I spend some time with my characters and get to know them and, and try to slip myself into their skin and, and figure out what they might think or do. And the story unfolds that way. And so, and, and when you're putting in, I would put in pieces of my own life, people I knew, um, stories that maybe I had read about in a newspaper or a magazine. Um, and so there are bits and pieces of real life and, and maybe that's why it feels like so raw and genuine and real because it is based on real things. Right. And it's very relatable as well. Even, you know, brought back memories of when I was a teenager, kind of like the thoughts, um, the fears, the anxiousness I had, and then kind of rolling you through adulthood. Uh, same types of thoughts and fears, but just a little bit even more elevated at that point. And I kind of saw myself, um, a little bit in every one of your stories. And now that you're saying that you're pulling from real life, you're pulling from stories, um, it makes it very relatable. I, I think also that you just mentioned one of the other places that I pull from, which are my memories. So I think, you know, just going back and thinking about adolescence and um, what it was like, you know, the first time I was with a boy is <laughs> a very universal feeling that many, many women can relate to. And I don't want to spoil anything for the readers, but my one of the short stories that stuck out for me was um, the story featuring the girlfriend, the boyfriend, and his Porsche. Oh. And I think it was, they had no names. It was just a very uh, small piece of the story, but it's just the emotions that how we feel as women sometimes um, and the, the lengths that we kind of go through especially me as an adolescent wanting to be the center of attention like that was the most honest and raw uh story for me i'm interested in how that one came about because it is a little bit different than the other ones that i had read in the book definitely yes um it's interesting that story is getting a lot of attention for different oh. reasons so um it came about because i had actually read another story and this is going back a long time ago and um, I was so, uh, and this is, I started out telling you that 
I would just get like um, enamored with an idea or mm -hmm. you know trying different things. And so it was the form of this story that intrigued me. And so I said, I'm gonna. T I want to sit down and, and use that as a template and try to make us write a story that is unusual in this way. And it was the first time I had written a story that was four pages, um, and it is different than the other stories in the collection. Mm -hmm. And um, I had fun writing it. I definitely had fun writing it. I mean, it, it also explored a lot of, like you said, um, feelings. Um, that women might have maybe some angry feelings <laughs> yeah, and, and not necessarily something that we talk about enough you know um, and I feel like for the people listening it's it's for me it's like jealousy it's wanting to be the spotlight the center of attention um, of my love interests right in the in this story the premise is this boyfriend of hers loves his Portia so much um, maybe he pays a little bit of attention more to it than to her and, and so it's things like that throughout your collections that I think what makes it so unique, but that one was definitely my favorite one. Oh, wow. Well, it's interesting. I also think that was a story where I could never behave like that character does. I could never do the actions that character does, but, you know, maybe I could live a life that I wouldn't actually live in my real life. I could live it on the page. Yes, a little bit of escapism. Yeah. But let's talk about the title. Like, right off the bat, it clearly alludes to the theme. Were there other titles you contemplated, or how did life and other shortcomings um, come about? So the other, there was one other title that was really, really close. And um, the first story in the collection is called Dinner Conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I was told that often collections are named after the first story. Oh, and I didn't I, know that. Yeah. And then I, I did a little research and saw that that was true. Not always, but mm -hmm. often. Um, and I thought Dinner Conversation was a reasonable title. I liked it. Um, and I thought that the book, all the stories have a conversational tone. So I really sat with it for a while. Um, I re in my gut, I liked Life and Other Shortcomings better. But I just thought maybe it should be Dinner Conversation. Anyway, in the end, I, I stuck with Life and Other Shortcomings because I just felt like it was... It had more personality or something. Well, both of them are really great contenders now that I hear dinner conversations. But I thought life and other shortcomings is like very tongue in cheek, very, um, you know what you're getting into. Uh, so I thought that was a really fun title as well, especially it goes really well with the cover that you chose for your book. Yeah, once, once I picked that as the title, everything started to just fall into place. Like I knew the direction we were heading in. Right. But how long does it take, like, how long did it take you to create this collection? What is the, how long is the writing process usually from start to finish to, you know, getting it to print and cover design and titles and things like that? You mean once it was accepted? Yeah. Not from the writing. Okay. Um, I'd say it was like a year and a half. Oh, like I like those kind of insights because as a reader, I kind of have no idea like what are the behind the scenes are. It's kind of nice to, to know that. Are you surprised that it takes that long or were you expecting was, that that was a process? No, no, no. I was surprised. But then once I got into the process, I started to say, ah, now I know why it takes so long. Uh. There's a lot to be done. Yeah. One of my favorite things that I had to do um, an exercise in picking the cover was I had to go to bookstores or libraries and look at covers and start to pay attention to what appealed to me. And that was a great exercise. And, and from there, I got choices based on those initial images that I sent. And the, the, the process went from there to pick a cover. And because I ended up being really happy with my cover. Yeah, it looks great. But that's very cool that they, you were very active in, exactly. the, in the covered um, activity. Because I, I think I have you know, heard that sometimes covers can be a surprise. Will you do you have an alternate cover as well? Like, so sometimes it gets released and you have a cover for the States and then you have a different cover um, if you choose to publish somewhere else or do you prefer just to keep it consistent? I would prefer to keep it consistent, at least for now. I'm super happy. And I love how bold it is. Like, it'll just jump right out at you if you're at the bookstore. Like, love this red. Yeah, I'm very happy with it. Thank you. But going back to the stories, because they are short stories, if you had to choose one to 
flesh out, which one would it be and why? So I think this question is kind of like asking me which is my favorite child. <laughs> does, it, does it kind of change as you like kind of think back and forth? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, I, yeah, I don't know that I could answer. Also now because the collection, while it is a collection of stories, they are loosely connected and they feel to me like they belong together mm -hmm. and pulled, and they tell a story over, you know, 40 years, um, starting in 1970 and going to like probably 2014. Um, and I think if you pulled out any one of the pieces, it would be a hole in the story. So I wouldn't want to do that. That's a very good answer. I mean, it does the, your collection of stories justice. You love them all equally. I do. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying to imagine, like put myself in a writer's shoes. What does Corey in writing mode look like? Oh. Well, that's an interesting sight. <laughs> I've got a gray, it was once upon a time a fluffy robe, but now it's, um, it's pretty worn. But it's a gray fluffy robe and gray furry slippers. And Love it. That's like your writer's, my writer's uh, garb. Your lucky writer's robe. Exactly. Yeah. And I kind of shuffle out of bed bright and early wearing that and you know, it can often be, if I'm in writing mode, it could be two o'clock before I pick my head up and I'm still in that. And as a writer, like, is it pen to paper? Is it laptop? What is your preferred method? Like, I know you said that you don't, you have a more like organic writing process where you're trying to get to know your characters. Is there any exercises that you do to kind of, um, get to know them or learn a little bit more about them? Um, I definitely start with paper and pen. Um, w way before I go to a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, once I have um, a really strong like skeleton, I'd, I start to put it in the computer just so that it, I can read the words. And I try to I go back and forth. I'll, I'll write some with the, with pen and paper, and then go back to my computer and keep working that way until at some point it's pretty much just in the computer, and I, I work on that copy. But more toward the end. Mm -hmm. So you're like it could be. Early morning, in your fuzzy slippers and robe, pen to paper, just hammering out ideas and stories that, that kind of inspired you from maybe something you read the other day or um, from your memories or just an idea you had. Yes, or something that's disturbing. And what do you mean by that? Well, I guess something that's on my, you know, it, I write about things that bring up strong feelings. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm thinking of the stories in this collection and there, you know, some things that have made me sad, some things that have aggravated me, some things that anger me, some things that, and I, when I say, you know, the, the, if I have these strong feelings, I'm pretty sure that other women, other people are having strong feelings to some of these situations as well. There are some storylines in there that I put myself in those shoes based on the emotions that you kind of uncovered there. And I could feel like unhappy for them in the situations that they were in. And, and I felt that like in their shoes, I could feel like empathetic towards them. I think the emotions was that strong. Well, that's wonderful to hear. And one of your stories actually covers... Um, is it the Jewish religion? Uh-huh, yes. And so did you have to do a lot of research on that? No, actually, I'm loosely connected to, uh, I mean, I am Jewish, mm -hmm. but that um, story is about an Orthodox Jewish woman, and I um, do not observe as uh, strictly as the woman in that story does, but um, I've, heard, I've heard of women having struggles and I wanted to explore that, what life would be like for women in a particular situation, in, in, a, in a man's world, and um, how a woman with her own mind and her own set of values deals with the constraints. Yeah, and, and as a reader, I don't, and I'm not really familiar with the Orthodox Jewish religion, so reading that was something entirely different for me. But at the same time, because she is a woman at the base of it all, and she has the same wants and needs that I do, I, I think that's where the connection, and it was easy to relate 
the magic of the reader and connecting with the story happen. So I did wonder, like, when you when writers write, like, how much research they have to do to go into it um, to kind of pull that to make it so realistic. Because I felt her frustrations. In, in this particular story, I mean, I probably had to do, I had to do some research, but it's also not that far removed from my real life. That I had some real life experiences that led me to that story. I don't want to give away too much because that that is um, one of the stories that stuck out second after the Porsche story. Um, so I definitely want your readers to be surprised and also go through their own emotions when they start reading your collection as well. I follow you on Instagram and I love the variety of your posts, like especially the quotes, the pop culture, how would you say aspects like that find their way into your writing style? That's so nice that you're saying that because Instagram was a real challenge for me. When you're scrolling, yours pop out most to me because it's always something fun. Like yeah. even today you posted something fun. Like I think it was Leonardo DiCaprio today. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Toasting my yes. weeks to book publication. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's been really fun. That that has taken um, a different sort of energy. I had to find my Instagram voice. Mm. I had to find my Instagram personality. And I feel like it's still developing. But I, I will say thank you for saying it's fun to, to see the post because I have been having fun doing it lately. And that is a huge accomplishment because it was really hard for me. I think it's just like photos you curate or like the captions that you have to go along with it they always pop out to me so I, I always like visiting your page um, just to see what you had posted that day so I thought that was really fun I did ask a question on my Instagram for uh, what they would like to ask you as an author and the question was what question do you wish people would ask you how does it feel to win an Emmy Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a speech? Do you, do you, do you ever have those like uh, practice speeches if you had ever won an Emmy? Uh, well, I do have a, one of my Instagram posts was a picture of my face on Anne Hathaway's body accepting her Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> when, and it did have something to do with um, you have to visualize to materialize. Oh, I like that. Oh, I might have to take that one. You have to visualize to materialize. Yep. Okay, listeners, go and check out her Instagram. And for our listeners, what is your Instagram handle? How can we connect with you? It's at Corey Ajme. I will link it um, in the description box below so people can come and visit your awesome Instagram. And I know it's already too soon, but do you know what you're working on next after your collections? Have you already been working on something or have any ideas of what you would like to do next? I actually have a novel already done. Ooh. Yep, and it's going to be published um, in the spring of 2022. So far away. Yeah, I just got a taste of your work, and I'm, I'm loving it, and I, wanted to, I was excited to see if you already had something in the works that we could read. Well, I'm, I'm glad that it's 98% uh, it's written, I would say. I might do another edit or two, but it's written. And um, now we just have to do that whole process you were asking me about before. Mm -hmm. And now that we know it's a year and a half. Yeah. And so for readers who want to pick up Life and Other Shortcomings, where can they do that on August 4th? Well, they can visit my website at coryajme.com. And if they go there, they, can, they have choices. They can buy from Barnes & Noble or IndieBound or Amazon. Um, or they can go directly to any one of those places. You know what I, I would love? I would love if everyone who picked up a book listening to our um, interview today to create like a fun hashtag of them and your book, like a book selfie. Wouldn't that be fun for everyone who did that? And maybe we can have like a special hashtag for it. I love that. Yeah, so if you have any hashtag ideas, let us know, and then I will um, share with everybody and then do like a Life and Other Shortcomings book selfie for everyone who has listened here to this interview today. Well, that sounds amazing and a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Well, thank you so much for joining us and giving us a little bit of insight into the writing process, um, your book, and just spending time with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I really loved talking with you. 
I will link all of Corey's handles below and how you can reach her and also pre-order and purchase her book, Life and Other Shortcomings, coming out August 4th. Congratulations again, Corey. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed listening to that interview with Corey Ajme. As always, wherever you are, I hope you're having a great day and I wish you happy reads. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.